Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 452 of the Juice Box Podcast. My guest in this episode is Francisco Leon, and you are not going to want to miss a word of what he has to say. You may recall that recently on episode 433, Carla Greenbaum was on talking about trial net. And during that conversation, she spoke about a drug called, oh, ready? Here I go. Teplizumab. Teplizumab? Teplizumab. I think that's right. Teplizumab. Well, I might not be able to say it, but you definitely want to hear about it. What's going to come next is an hour long conversation that I found absolutely riveting as a person who has family members and loved ones impacted by autoimmune disease. I hope it strikes you the same way. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. All right, a little more business and then we'll get right to it. Let's let the music do its thing first, though. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is ad-free, but that is because of the support of Omnipod Dexcom, the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter, TouchedByType1.org, the T1D Exchange, and Gvoke HypoPen. What I mean by ad-free is there won't be any ads, but there will be a break in the middle of the show where I try in 30 seconds to get out the links to all the sponsors of the Juice Box Podcast. And I'm going to remind you of some links that'll be pertinent to this episode. We'll see what I can do. 30 seconds. I'll give it a try. Good morning, Scott. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Francisco Leon. I am the chief scientific officer and a co-founder of Prevention Bio. I am an immunologist by training, and perhaps you can tell by my accent that I am from Spain. I've been in the U.S. for over 25 years now. Um, my entire life has been dedicated to try to find solutions for patients with autoimmune diseases. And that's what brought me to the U.S. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about my background later, if you'd like. Yeah, I am interested, though, before we move on, what made you focus on autoimmune? I actually came to autoimmunity from the science side, but it quickly became personal. Let me explain that. Mm. My mom lost her kidneys to very severe stone disease. She was on the waiting list for a transplant and she had to wait for eight years. She got her transplant and it was rejected by the immune system mm -hmm. when I was a teenager. And she had to go back to dialysis. And that, that influenced me a lot because I just couldn't understand why would the immune system reject perfectly functioning kidneys and, and condemn her to a life tied to a machine. Right. So I went to medical school. In the middle of my medical training, I, I took time off to do research and I became a bit of a an autoimmunity aficionado because back in those days, this is the, um, the late 1993, the first trigger for autoimmunity was found, gluten triggering celiac disease, the first antigen. Mm -hmm. And I focused on that, tried to understand how does autoimmunity start? I finished my medical education. I did my PhD in autoimmunity and in celiac. And I learned that the mechanisms that lead to celiac are identical to other autoimmune disorders, such as type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. It's always the same sequence of events, a genetic predisposition towards autoimmunity, a vital trigger 
the loss of immune tolerance against yourself, tissue destruction, and then symptoms and complications. So from very early on in my career, I wanted to be able to contribute to stopping this sequence of events. I did a, a residency in clinical immunology to have the, the patient side as well, not just the, the laboratory side. And then I came to the US to work at the NIH, at NIAID. And from there, I went to the pharmaceutical industry to translate all the basic research into medicines or solutions. And I was really fortunate that over time, I was able to contribute to a few drugs that have made a big difference in, in autoimmunity, uh, in diseases like psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease at companies like Bristol-Myers Squibb, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Ultimately, I got a little restless because Big Pharma is really outstanding at doing the hard work to get medicines through patients but they focus a little bit too much on chronic disease. Okay. They wait a little bit too long until patients have too much damage, too many symptoms before they intervene. So I, I learned from one of the leaders in this field, Professor Haidt and Dr. Haidt. He's both a professor and a Johnson & Johnson leader. He developed a theory that we should be focusing early on. He created something called the Disease Interception Accelerator at Johnson & Johnson. And I totally bought into those concepts. But J&J &J was too slow to implement this with new vision. So I left, I became an entrepreneur. I started a company with the other co-founder of Prevention, Ashley Palmer. Mm -hmm. We started a small company called Cell Immune to start testing these concepts of intercepting autoimmune disease and to do it in a fast and cost-effective way. Salimune was successful. We were acquired by Amgen and that gave us the resources to then start prevention. Salimune focused on celiac, but for prevention, we wanted to go all in into autoimmunity by tackling multiple targets upstream in the cascade of the immune events. The T cells, the B cells, the innate immunity. Those are the three legs of the stool of autoimmunity. And we were very fortunate that our T cell drug, teplizumab, was so successful at intercepting type 1 diabetes. That is what really put prevention on the map. And the reason we're talking today but I, I do want to mention that we continue working on celiac disease. We continue working on B cell autoimmunity, uh, for example, lupus as a B cell model disease. And we are the first company that has declared our goal is eradication of autoimmunity by working upstream, working in the early stages of the disease. So we are now in a, in a privileged and, and highly responsibility inducing position for us to lead this new um, era in medicine. Is the, is the simple idea that you do screenings, find antibodies that say that this thing is likely to come for you and then jump in ahead of it? That is one of the main ideas. You, you could even go earlier than antibodies. You could go to the genetic predisposition as well. So as, as you know, Scott, we are screening at birth for over 250 monogenic diseases in babies, mm -hmm. and they take a little bit of blood. Um, why not screen for autoimmune predisposition as well? It will just add a little bit of cost, but it could tell us if that baby is going to be predisposed to autoimmunity. And then parents could monitor, you could try to avoid the triggers, but also you could try to be educated so that if disease does appear and you can monitor that with the antibodies as the second test, 
you can react quickly and you can intercept it before there is damage to the organs. Can I ask you, do you know, are autoimmune issues becoming more prevalent or are there just so many more people on the planet that we see more of it? Both. They are truly becoming more prevalent as societies become cleaner. I I don't know if you've um, read about this hygiene hypothesis, which now is no longer a hypothesis, it's it's proven. Um, Back in the day, there were a lot of helminth infections. Helminths are basically worms. There was a day in, in America when people had ringworms and um, things were not as clean as they are today. Mm-hmm. And the, the immune system has basically two, two types of responses. One type of response goes against worms and it's called the Th2 response. And there's another type of response that is geared towards killing infected cells. And that is the Th1 response. And they are balanced. Once the worms were eradicated, the Th2 arm was weak and the Th1 arm began to dominate our responses. And that created a great susceptibility for the development of autoimmunity. And this is all fully proven. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting anecdote. There's this region in Finland called Karelia. Karelia is a huge place that was split in 1945 between Finland and the Soviet Union. In the Finnish side, as industrialization, hygiene took over, autoimmune diseases began to double every 20 years in terms of prevalence, true prevalence. In the Soviet side, it remained flat. And the only difference was hygiene. It was the same genes, the same food, et cetera. So that led to research that finally proved the um, increase in autoimmunity is due to industrialization. Okay, I, I have to make sure I understand. Um, are, are, is the idea that we've done such a good job of cleaning things up that there were benefits we were getting from some of this that we're not getting any longer? Exactly. As, as we lost an enemy to the immune system, the immune system has begun to turn against ourselves so, more often. Can I call you uh, Francisco? Of course. Yeah, yeah, Francisco. Are you are you married? I am. All right. So I've noticed, I've been married a long time, that when my wife is mad at somebody else, she's nicer to me. Is that what we're talking <laughs> about right now? <laughs> like we, we took, we, you mean our autoimmune, our immune system has nothing to do, so it's bored and it's like, hey, let me take a shot at that pancreas? It, 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 is, it is the case. Wow. Uh, the, the immune system has a finite um, set of resources. And when it is distracted with, with an external enemy, it doesn't pay as much attention to the internal self. So George Carlin was right. You've ever, have you ever heard the comedian George Carlin say that when I was young, we used to swim in the river with people's feces and I've never been sick a day in my life? That that. It, it is it is true. Um, okay. I know this this sounds almost funny, but um, again, let me go back to Finland. Please, fin- Finland is the leading country in the world in terms of autoimmune research because they have the the highest hygiene in the world, together with Japan. And Japan is terrible now in terms of uh, atopic dermatitis, things like that, affecting forty percent of the population as well. They are having similar problems there. So the the Finns um, are really tackling this problem. First, they began to follow all consecutive newborns in the country. They did the genetic screening, and then they did they started to look for autoantibodies. So imagine imagine doing that in the U.S. All newborns, right? That's something that requires a national effort. But the the Finns did it. This is a study called DIP. And DIP stands for Diabetes Interception and Prediction Study. So they identified hundreds of patients with T1D. And because they had collected samples from those children and even from their mothers for over 20 years, every three months they collected samples, they found that 
there was only one commonality to all of those patients. They had an infection by Coxsackie B virus. In the six to 12 months preceding the onset of T1D. Mm -hmm. And those children who did not have any other infection, have no worms, nothing, everything's clean there, their immune system overreacted against that Coxsackie infection. And it later it was found Coxsackie infects the beta cells of the pancreas directly. The receptor for Coxsackie is expressed inside the insulin granules. It's like a Trojan horse for Coxsackie. So the immune system of those children overreacted against Coxsackie, destroyed beta cells. And in those who had predisposition to autoimmunity, they developed T1D. And if the mothers had immunity against Coxsackie virus, the children had 50% less T1D. That was the genesis of our vaccine project. That's how prevention started. Our first project was we need to develop a vaccine for Coxsackie B virus because then we can reduce the incidence of T1D. The second step was, okay, what kills those infected beta cells? That is the T cells, the activated T cells. So how do we stop those T cells in people who already got the infection? That is teplizumab. And that's why we began working on these two areas. Just to complete the Finnish story, once they realized what was going on, in Finland now there are companies that sell dirt, dirt from farms that are not clean. They put it in the baby's bonnets in the socks It's in um, little pouches, and then the baby gets exposed to that diversity of antigens that distracts the immune system. Now, in, in the immune system, just like in life, in society, diversity is very important. If you don't have diversity of exposure, that's when the immune system focuses on just one thing, and that's never good. I, I have to thank you, and you're not going to see this coming, but... My daughter is almost 17 years old, and she was diagnosed with type 1 when she was 2. I am a stay-at-home dad, and I was at that time. And uh, she had Coxsackie virus right before she was diagnosed with type 1. And I spent a lot of time, you know, I think like many people do, wondering what they could have done differently. And I always thought, I wonder if I didn't wash my hands enough before I made food. Like, it was a ridiculous thought, but it's all I had to try to understand it. And you just made me feel uh, better over. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Wow. I uh, I, I I didn't know Scott that no. that uh, she had Coxsackie. Um, you couldn't have done anything. Coxsackie is a tremendously common infection, and it's just under recognized because in most people it only causes a, a very mild disease. It's an enterovirus. It causes some gut disturbance, respiratory disturbance. But over time, now we know it's it's not just a very likely cause of T1D. It's also a very likely cause of celiac disease, myocarditis, heart failure and heart transplant cause due to Coxsackie, the number one cause of viral myocarditis. And recently also potentially congenital heart defects in babies. So we are we are now in the middle of our first clinical trial for this vaccine. And I think that's thanks to thanks to folks like you you educating people because most people don't know about Coxsackie virus. No. I hope that the trials will work and we'll be able to provide this vaccine so that people will have no infection by Coxsackie virus. Well, this this conversation alone leads me to believe that I can direct my children to in you know when this vaccine exists one day to use it for their newborns and and hopefully they'll get to skip this diabetes uh, hellscape that we live in. Um, I have to tell you, we figured it out because like we we were we are you know as positive as we could be as a family that the Coxsackie caused Arden's type one or or precipitated it because she got it. And 
it seemed to go away, but it didn't. And then suddenly it was back again. And I remember our pediatrician saying, that's strange. You don't get this twice. So it was almost as if it never was gone. And then we started focusing on the other issues she was having and sort of lost track of the Coxsackie. And then it, and then it, it burst out again. And that's, then, then the, the diabetes came. And of course we lost track of the Coxsackie for a while, but then in retrospect, it just seemed obvious if it was a uh, something that people get that's so normal and it's you know sort of like chicken pox and that you get it once you don't get it again it must have never been eradicated from her the first time is what we thought is that that that's correct wow. that's correct uh Coxsackie virus almost never gets cleared fully and that 60% of children with T1D who had the Coxsackie infection uh before the diagnosis. There has been a, a study in donors, ca- cadaveric donors, people who donate their pancreas for research when they die. Mm-hmm. And it's the same 60%. The virus is still in the remaining beta cells. It's it's uh, something you cannot get rid of. So, so here's how things are going to change, Scott, in the future, because there's a, a lot of hope coming for Arden and for Arden kids as well. Okay. So a whole new future. First, we'll be able to screen for genetic risk. The The markers are already known so that their babies will be identified as high risk for this disease, that disease. And then you can use knowledge to reduce the risk. Second is vaccines will help prevent these triggers and reduce the incidence. But then third, for those who still will be exposed to other viruses, because Coxsackie is probably not the only virus that causes T1D. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's 60%. So there's something else, other viruses probably. So what happens next? You screen with antibodies. All you need to do is to screen two to three times in a person's life to catch those patients with early disease. H two to three, H five to six, nine to ten, or perhaps in puberty, because once the immune system reaches puberty, there is a general resetting of the immune system. When the genital organs appear, there are new antigens, and the immune system takes a break to allow new antigens to appear. Otherwise, nobody would have genital organs; they would be destroyed by the immune system. Hmm. So during that resetting, the risk of autoimmunity starts to go down, right? And that's why the peak of diagnosis of T1D is age 12, 13, just before puberty. So if we can get people past puberty, we're going to reduce T1D a lot. And then what happens to those who still will develop it? Because somebody will still, the immune system will restart and develop it. So we will have immunomodulatory drugs like teplizumab and and other drugs in development. If and when these drugs are approved, they can be given to people who have the antibodies because the antibodies indicate the disease is already ongoing. It's just that you still have enough beta cells that you don't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. But T1D is truly a, a continuum. Once you get the infection, you break tolerance. Once you break tolerance, you develop antibodies. You start losing your beta cells because the T cells kill the beta cells. And it's a countdown. Once you have two or more autoantibodies, there are four total different autoantibodies. It's no longer a matter of if, but when will you develop clinical T1D. And that's when the countdown starts for us to intercept as well. Okay. The sooner we intervene, the more beta cells the patient will have, and we can even prevent insulin dependency if we rescue enough beta cells. And I will tell you in a minute about the results of our clinical trial uh, at risk to illustrate this concept of early prevention. But I just want to complete the, the continuum but by talking about what happens once you develop clinical T1D, what happens if somebody has lost all of their beta cells 
is there hope there? All right, you ready? 30 seconds. Let me see what I can do here. And go. Check out the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Learn more about the Contour Next One blood glucose meter at ContourNext.com forward slash juice box. Get a free, no obligation demo of the Omnipod Tubal Insulin Pump or see if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash at MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box. Support the T1D Exchange, T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. Do you want to check out the glucagon that my daughter carries? gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. And of course, always throw your support behind touchedbytype1.org. Would you like to learn more about the company we're hearing about today? Proventionbio.com. P-R-O-V-E-N-T-I-O-N bio.com. All these links are available at juiceboxpodcast.com or right there in the show notes of your podcast player. And if you're looking for those diabetes pro tip episodes that you've heard so much about, they're in there too. They begin at episode 210, and you can also find them at diabetesprotip.com. How'd I do? Let's look. Hold on. I started at 2506, and I went to 2556. Oh, well, that was like 50 seconds. All right, so not 30 seconds, but not bad. And no full ads, right? Please support the sponsors when you can. They keep episodes like this going. They keep the show free. They keep your juice box flowing. Let's get back to Francisco. There's a lot more coming. This is a really great episode. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed making this for you. Is there hope? The answer is yes. As you have seen recently, tremendous progress has been made to generate pancreatic beta cells from stem cells. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be an opportunity to replenish beta cells in Arden and in other people who need beta cells. But we still need to overcome one issue. When you transplant beta cells into a, a patient, this is a transplant. The same thing is going to happen that happened to my mom. The transplant is going to be rejected by the immune system, and this is called allo rejection. It means a reaction against something foreign. The second issue is if you have T1D and the cells are truly beta cell looking, they are going to be destroyed by the autoimmune attack. So you have two problems. Again, that's where these immune modulating drugs are going to be helpful because they will stop the allo and the auto attack. We have already data that shows that teplizumab reduces both allo and auto attack of beta cells. So in the future, and I'm not talking 50 years from now, I'm talking five to 10 years from now, it will be possible to transplant stem cell-derived beta cells and give teplizumab or another immune modulatory drug at the same time to induce tolerance against those cells. And then we will be able to start talking about a cure for T1D. Mm. T1D is going to be the first autoimmune disease to be eradicated by vaccination, by early screening and detection, by early treatment, and finally by replenishment of beta cells. So you'll, you'll put the beta cells back, and then you'll protect them from being attacked, and then you'll stop the, the body from doing what it did the first time with the, uh, the, the plismab. With the plismab and with other approaches. It's right. just that the plismab is the first. Is encapsulation one of those ideas? The idea of putting the cells inside of sort of a packet that's protected? Yes. So encapsulation will help. The, the problem is so far it hasn't worked because when you put cells inside the capsule, inside the body, there's something called the foreign body reaction. And it's another immune attack. It's a bit different. This attack is not specific against the beta cells because the immune system doesn't see the beta cells once they are in the capsule, but it reacts against the capsule mm -hmm. and it, it causes something called fibrosis. 
that surrounds the capsule with a material that makes it difficult for insulin to come in and out. So there are groups now working on better capsules, and, and we certainly root for them. But in, in our opinion, it's going to take multi-prong approaches here to succeed. Okay. Perhaps a capsule that is um, semi-porous, it allows some transit, but not, not a lot, mm -hmm. of, so that you have some protection afforded by the capsule. But still immune modulation to have a more specific reduction of the reactivity. It, it's kind of fascinating how well your immune system works, but the, how stupid it is at the same time, isn't it? Like the, that a foreign body could be in your in your inside of you, and that your immune system could look at it and say, "Well, we can't kill it, so we'll surround it so well that it can't pass in or out of what we surround it with." But it can't look at your pancreas and go, "Hey, that's ours. Let's not do that." It, it's um, it, it's fascinating how strong and yet um, yeah. un unguided it can be. Yeah, it it well the the problem is it's it's this trigger. The trigger is what fools the immune system mm -hmm. because the immune system is programmed to attack cells that are infected so that the infection doesn't propagate. Right. And and we are just unlucky that certain viruses have learned to infect the beta cells because they are generally well protected. The the beta cells are normally the last thing the immune system attacks. Think, think that in our entire body, there's only one gram of beta cells. It's so precious. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has some mechanisms called immune privilege. And that's why the viruses hijack it and go inside because they know if I'm, if I'm inside the beta cell, I'm, I'm, I have a high likelihood of survival here. But eventually the immune system finds a way to kill the cell kill the virus, but then the collateral damage is type 1 diabetes. So the Coxsackie hides in the beta cell because it's such a protected spot and the auto, your, and your immune system does such a good job of rooting it out that eventually it gets to it. Exactly. Wow. So it's like a crab trying to hide in a shell under the ocean and the fish that go by and just sift, sift, sift and eventually hit one and there it is. Exactly. It, wow, no kidding. Uh, I did not expect this to go this way. I'm having a, a good time. And at the same time, I hope you uh, forgive me. I'm much more emotional than I usually am while we're uh, doing these things. So I feel a little flush at the moment. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to lose track of what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, okay, so how close so I have um, people from trial net on whenever they want to come on because I love obviously what they do. And um, it's starting to, it, teplizumab is an interesting name because it's a word that used to get thrown around years ago, like, oh, there's a drug, you know, and now all of a sudden it's like, hey, this drug might be coming and it is coming. And like, where are we at? And what's the application real world without the rest of the stuff needing to be figured out yet? Like, what can we do right now? Right. And, and, and thank you, Scott, for mentioning TrialNet because they, they are the heroes in this story. Prevention is standing on the shoulder of giants here. We we are the last cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. We take all of this research and we translate it into a, a drug that can be brought to patients, right? And I don't mean to minimize our hard work and the team's hard work. Um, the prevention team is amazing, but it's it's been 25 years since... Academic folks like Jeff Bluestone, Kevin Harold, and the, the TrialNet group, Carla Greenbaum at TrialNet, and everybody, it's hundreds of people who have been doing one study after another after another. And things not always worked, and that's what you were referring to. Yeah. At some point, the plizumab was considered the failed drug because one trial failed the primary endpoint, the a newly diagnosed protege study failed the primary endpoint. But uh, prevention, we recognized that the trial failed the drug. It was a problem with the endpoint. The drug still did the same thing had, it had always done. It had always shown protection of beta cells. That's why we acquired teplizumab. And then TrialNet conducted the at-risk study, TN10, while we are conducting a repeat of the protege study in newly diagnosed patients. So that way we can cover both 
sides of the coin. The at-risk data will help us if the FDA agrees provide this drug to patients who have early disease, the so-called at-risk, which just means early disease. And then the, the new study, it's called PROTECT, will help us provide the drug to newly diagnosed patients, but with the same exact mechanism, protect the beta cells from the autoimmune attack. So you ask the question, what can we do now? So it's it's coming, it's coming. The um, the so-called PDUFA date, which is the technical term for the date when the FDA is going to opine on teplizumab, is July the 2nd. So it's imminent. In just a few months, we are going to know if the FDA considers that the data merits approval. And if they don't, they will tell us what else is necessary. Mm-hmm. But we're hoping that we should be able to provide this drug to patients in the very near future so that we can stop intercepting disease. The other thing that we need to get out is the need for screening. Because if we have the drug, but folks don't know that they have the preclinical disease, the pre-symptomatic disease, it's not going to help them. So we need to get out to families and, and just show families that if they get screened, they can prevent disease in other family members. And it's not just the children. Sometimes the parents develop the disease years after the children. So everybody needs to get screened. And now there are great initiatives in place to facilitate this. The JDRF has uh, T1 Detect. Mm-hmm. T1 Detect is an amazing program. It's at home. You just go online, you sign up, If you have insurance, you pay $55. That is covered by insurance. If you don't have insurance, Prevention has subsidized this program. We provided the grant, and you only pay 10 bucks Hmm. to get all the autoantibodies done, the the panel. You take a drop of blood from your finger with a little lancet, put it on a filtered paper, send it on the mail in a prepaid envelope, and then a few days later, you get your results at home in a secure email, and it will tell you if you have a risk of developing clinical T1D or not, if you have autoantibodies or not. So this is a huge advance, national program offered to everybody. Uh, Obviously, families are the the most aware, but even um, the general public should start to think about this. It, It doesn't really hurt to get tested and if you're negative, you have that peace of mind. If, if you're positive, now you have knowledge that might help you stop the disease. That's excellent. No, I, 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 can't, I can't say enough of, of what I think of what everyone's doing. Um, I, I, and your date is July 2nd. So you're coming up on So say this happens then. I send in my paper and you find antibodies and it's past July 2nd and the FDA said, okay. I start taking the drug and it does what? So if we get approved and you are positive for two or more autoantibodies in this at-home test, you go to your doctor because we want your doctor, your endocrinologist to confirm the results and to take additional blood because when you have two or more autoantibodies, you have early stage T1D. But the question is, how advanced is it? Do you already have dysglycemia, which is when you have abnormal glucose levels in your blood? And that's an important question, because if you have dysglycemia, you have 75% chances of developing clinical T1D, insulin dependent, in five years. And you have 30% chances in one year. So that means it's urgent. But if you don't have this glycemia, the risk is lower. It's 44% in five years. And then you may, it's your choice. You may want to wait or you may want to act. That that question is still a bit unresolved. What happens without this glycemia? Our um, application to the FDA is for patients with autoantibodies and this glycemia, we, we will recommend that then your physician 
considers teplizumab. Mm -hmm. So then teplizumab is a drug that is given as 14 days of infusions every day between 30 minutes and 60 minutes. The reason it's like this is to prevent and minimize side effects by splitting the dose in very small doses that are given daily for 14 days. And we've, this has been tested over all of these 20 years of research that if you do it this way, the safety profile is well managed. So you will receive infusions for two weeks and that's it. Teplizumab is not a chronic drug. And that's a big differentiation from other therapeutics that are in the market. And the reason is that we are catching the disease early and resetting the immune system. So we don't have to give this drug every month for life as other drugs need to be given when, once you have lost your, your function of your organ, et cetera, it's a chronic disease. Here we're intervening early and that affords us the ability to just dose once. The data is as follows. After you get two weeks of teplizumab, the median, the median is basically the average delay to developing clinical T1D with insulin dependency is three years. So three years delay on average after two weeks of therapy is what the data showed. Now some patients will have one year of delay. The vast majority will have at least one year. Some patients have eight or more years of delay. And then what happens next? That question, we don't know the answer yet. We believe we should be able to dose again and again delay the disease for another number of years. But those data are not available. That is work that we are going to undertake now. But our hypothesis is that by providing teplizumab a few times in the life of a pre-symptomatic patient, we might be able to indefinitely delay the disease. And then if you indefinitely delay the clinical disease, you're almost talking about a functional cure in a way because you never need insulin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I'm As you're talking, it keeps occurring to me that uh, everything you know about this comes from what your mother went through and uh, and how grateful I am and everybody will be when they hear this, that her experience led you in this direction, you know. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. But I, I obviously I I owe everything to my mother. But you, you, um, uh, you owe more to others than to me because I'm really just last the, the last cog in the wheel here. Um, there's so many people who have worked on this for so long. Uh, let me mention that our chief medical officer, Dr. Lenny Ramos, who is a transplant nephrologist, and that's the reason I met her, because, again, the kidney transplant, um, she actually worked with teplizumab many years ago in an academic setting, and she is a big part of the reason why we paid attention on teplizumab and acquired the drug. So it's, it's, it just cannot be underemphasized how it takes a village to do this. Uh, hundreds and thousands of scientists and physicians, and more importantly, the volunteers. The volunteers in the clinical trials, they, they take the risk to help society, and it's, it's, uh, they are the real heroes. Well, no, for certain, I mean, I, I'm just hearing your, you know, I, I see your background here, and then in my mind, I'm thinking of all the, just like you said, all these other people, and I wonder what all their impetuses was, like what 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 got them to lean in this direction, um, take the risk, you know, uh, if they're going to be involved in a study or devote their life's work in this direction. It's just very, um, you'll never know, you know, one day when, you know, if, if, if what you say is true, if, if there's a future where my children's children can take a vaccine that stops them from getting Coxsackie virus, that stops them from having an autoimmune response, um, they'll never know how lucky they are or where all this came from. You know, it's, it's really fascinating. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't want to stop you because you are doing such a great job, but I do have some questions in front of me. Are we at the point where I should ask them to you or do you have more that you want to add? No, please. Let, let's go with your questions. Okay. So these are all from people who listen to the podcast. One person wants to know if the effectiveness is in any way con connected to the age of the patient. The answer is no. We have the data is published. The effect of the map was similar in children and adults. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a next question, which you've covered. They wanted to know about um, what you would need to qualify to use the drug besides antibodies, but you've gone over that there'll need to be uh, some uh, oral glucose testing, I guess, right? Making sure that you are uh, on your way into the process of not being able to hold back your own blood sugar anymore. Um, right. Do you have any plans of using this on people who have had type one forever to see what impact it has on them? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm, the answer is yes, but it, it, I need to qualify the answer. So on one hand, the, the low hanging fruit is the combination with beta cell transplant, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. But it is true that, you know, even in patients with long-standing disease, there is always a little bit of um, C-peptide, which is the marker for beta cells in the circulation in the blood. There's always a little bit of C-peptide that can be found, comes up, comes down. It seems that there are always some beta cells that start to grow and then disappear. And the question is, is that an attempt by the pancreas to regenerate the beta cells that is quickly overcome by the immune system? And then you could potentially give teplizumab at that time when those beta cells are starting to grow before they are destroyed. But this is purely speculation, and we don't have any data to, to support this other than this observation that even even in after 50 years of T1D, you still have some beta cells in your pancreas. Okay. Um, are there any uh, side effects from taking the treatment, either short or long term? Yes, all, all drugs have side effects. So with the plisumab, the observations are related to the mechanism. It's an immune modulating drug. When it gets into a patient's body and it deactivates the T cells that kill the beta cells, that deactivation results in something called um, release of cytokines for a few days. When the cytokines are released, about a third of patients experienced a skin rash, just like if you had like an allergy. It's, it's a bit itchy. It only lasts a few days and it resolves by itself. Mm -hmm. the, the second observation, the patient doesn't see this, but the doctors will see that about two thirds of the patients have a, a change in the white blood cells in the circulation, changes in the numbers. And those changes also are limited in time. Everything's going back to normal within four to six weeks. And because the plizumab is given just as a two week infusion, we haven't seen any side effect long-term. We have data up to seven years. There hasn't been an increase in infection. There hasn't been an increase in anything else. Um, so at this time, we feel comfortable as a company presenting this data to the FDA for their evaluation. And we hope that they will agree with our assessment. Excellent. Um, this is, uh, the, the show has a, a worldwide audience and there people are wondering outside of the US, is, are you working on getting approvals in any, uh, any other countries? Indeed, we are actively uh, discussing with the European regulatory agency, now with the British regulatory agency as well, after Brexit, and with countries in the Middle East, Israel, etc. We are um, trying to do as much as we can, but let me also mention that we are a small company, and the biggest thing that uh, we believe could help us bring this drug worldwide will be a, a partner. We are actively seeking partnership with a big pharmaceutical company so that they will help us expand access 
outside of the U.S. In the U.S., we can manage, but outside of the U.S., we will need a partner. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't bring this up very often, but my wife is um, uh, uh, a drug safety professional for her entire like adult life, and she's incredibly good at it. And if I let her hear this episode, um, she's going to want to come work for you. So... Uh, <laughs> I, All right, let, let's talk. <laughs> uh, it's really amazing. Well, you have to reach back to your old friends now, right? You didn't burn any bridges leaving J and J, did you? <laughs> no, I, di- I didn't. I didn't. Now because I am. I am doing what what they taught me to do. Yeah. Um, so certainly J and J is is a wonderful company. As you know, they are now really really busy manufacturing hundreds of millions of doses of COVID nineteen vaccine. So mm-hmm. that. That actually is impacting a little bit uh, progress in other areas. Yeah. Not, you know, everybody is logically focused on COVID, the FDA, um, the, the pharma companies. But um, I think we're all seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with COVID, and then we should be able to focus on these other problems. And actually, as you know, um, COVID-19 affects predominantly people with diabetes and COVID-19 can trigger diabetes. Had a ge- well. So ha- yeah, we had a gentleman on a couple of weeks ago who got sick, had a stroke, developed type one diabetes and needed a five way bypass. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Just well, amazing. I hope, I hope he made it. But he, he's doing well, actually. It's oh, fascinating. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, listen, if for people who can't believe what you just said, my wife just stood in the kitchen and explained to me the other day, the reason we got through the vaccine so quickly is because companies really did put aside a lot of their other work and focus their employees on just one thing. And I can personally attest the fact that she's been sitting in my dining room for 12 to 18 hours a day working on this for the last year. So it, uh, well, thank, thank you to her oh, and, and all others who, who are getting us throughout uh, this, this time. Yeah, no, but I, to your point, like we, do also need to get back to looking at other things like this. Uh, just real quickly, as I go to the next question, Claire would like you not to forget Australia. She says Australia always gets left behind in type one diabetes. So um, yeah, no, uh, we 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 are we are looking, we, we're talking to Australian uh, folks as well. It's it's such an innovative country, and and they have a great uh, system there for screening. Again, going back to screening, that that is the key, and Australia is one of the few countries in the world with with a screening program. A screening program that we don't have in the U.S. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., it's only TrialNet and a few other programs, ASK in Colorado, etc. So we we all need to enhance screening lobby so that this becomes more of a national effort. What ages did your FDA submission cover? Our current submission is age seven and above. The trials started at um, above age seven, so eight and above through 45, but we probably will, um, it, it, we believe that the drug should at least get approved age eight and above. Okay. It, it is, and there's always the sign, I'm, I know you're not, you wouldn't be telling anybody to do it, but doctors could see the value and use it off label or no? We can certainly not recommend that, but a doctor can always use judgment and look at the scientific data, look at the clinical data, look at the label, and then determine what's best for their patients. Uh, that's just something that we as a company, all we can do is to continue doing trials. So we have now um, in, in place all the plans to study age zero and above, so children uh, from from birth, and to expand into other populations as well and do combinations and work with beta cells, et cetera, expand the label to maximize access. Um, autoimmune markers, like you said, you need to have two. Is there any efficacy change if people have more markers? Yeah, that's another great question. We we have cut the data in, in so many ways to try to answer that question. And the FDA has done that as well and, and clinicians. And at this time, well, the caveat is that the study, the pivotal study at risk TN10 is a small study. So when you start cutting the data in, in many different ways, you end up with very few patients in, in those groups. And it's a bit hard to make conclusions. But our conclusion is that the drug 
has the potential to help every patient as long as they have beta cells. So the only group we may not see benefit is when the C peptide is, is undetectable, that those patients may, may not have enough beta cells to protect. But as long as you have detectable beta cells, given that the mechanism of disease is similar in everybody, it's all driven by the T cells, we, we see benefit in across the board. Wow. Um, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I have one more here. It just slipped away from my eyes. Oh, are there any um, known drug interactions? No, because this is a, a biologic drug, a monoclonal antibody. And um, biologic drugs, they, they typically don't have drug interactions. They're highly specific. Mm-hmm. So actually, in terms of FDA approval, you don't even have to study this because it's well known that biologics don't have uh, drug-drug interactions. Are things really moving that way? Um, like ideas like stuff like Zolaire for asthma or uh, chronic urticaria, stuff like that, that, that's a biologic as well. Um, do you think the industry is paying more attention to that now or is, do we just understand more so we can can work in that space better? Um, both. I think there is a lot of progress in the design and manufacture of biologic drugs, which are more specific than oral drugs, the pills and tablets. There is a place for both, right? Um, the problem with biologics is that they have to be injected. And some people don't like injections, logically. So there are instances when a pill or a capsule can get you through a disease and there's no need to go for injections. But if if you are looking for something highly specific and safer because it doesn't have this kind of interactions and something that can be given less often because the biologics typically have very long effects, then biologics are a, a good solution. Yeah, I um, suffered low iron uh, a year or so ago, and the I and that the oral just was not doing it for me. So I took an infusion a couple of times uh, to to bring my ferritin levels up, and it was amazing how quickly it worked compared to what what was happening with the, the oral meds. Well, Scott, let me make a plug now yeah. um, for celiac disease because celiac disease is the number one cause of low iron anemia Mm -hmm. in the U.S. of unknown origin and is highly associated with with type 1 diabetes. So just like folks need to screen for T1D auto antibodies, family members of T1D patients should also take a celiac test if they have any of these unexplained manifestations. Uh, And it's the same. It's it's just a finger stick and, and looking for auto antibodies against the celiac antigen. And that celiac can can be present and impacting you in ways without you feeling sick to your stomach when you eat food. That's it, correct. Right. It's not common, it's not common, but about 20% of patients with celiac don't have gastrointestinal symptoms. Okay, that's interesting. Well, okay, is there anything that we missed or we should have said that we didn't? I don't wanna leave anything out. I really appreciate this opportunity to get the word out because raising awareness is the most important thing now so that people can benefit from these advances we've discussed. Um, So just thank you for all the work you've done to educate your audience. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we have our info at preventionbio.com. If you have any questions, we'll make sure to address them. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can get to it. I just genuinely appreciate you doing this um, and that uh, and that you were able to make it work in your schedule because I was I was so tight. I didn't know where to put you and I really wanted to have you on. So thank you for, for being flexible like this. No, thank you, Scott. Well, a huge thanks to Francisco for coming on the show and doing such a great job of explaining teplizumab. Did I get it? Teplizumab. I have it. I might not have it. Anyway, I found everything about this hour to be incredibly uplifting and hopeful. I hope you did as well. Thanks also to Omnipod, Dexcom, Touched by Type 1, the T1D Exchange, Gvoke 
glucagon and the contour next one blood glucose meter the advertisers make the show possible they give me the time and the freedom to do these recordings edit them and get them to you so all of my thanks to them please if you have a need for any of those devices and you'd like to learn more use the links that are provided in the show notes when you check them out it'll help keep the show free Before I go, let me thank you. Some really amazing reviews were left recently on Apple Podcasts for the show that I greatly appreciate. Thank you so much to everyone who takes the time to rate and review the show so positively. I want to remind you again about ProventionBio.com. If you go there, I've been doing this this morning, and click on their pipeline. You can read about the drugs that they have and uh, what they're hoping to do with them and where they are along the process. It's very, uh, very interesting It's fascinating, worth a little bit of your time. The show has resources that we hope you use. And by we, I mean me, as I'm the only one here. The Diabetes Pro Tip episodes, as I mentioned earlier, begin at episode 210, and they're also available at diabetesprotip.com. At that same link, you'll find all of the Defining Diabetes episodes. Of course, you can always go to juiceboxpodcast.com to find those things. And if you're on Facebook and you're looking for an incredibly supportive group of people talking about type 1, you're looking for the listeners of the Juicebox Podcast. That group is called Juicebox Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. It's a private group. It has about 10,000 people in it, and the conversations are just, um, they're excellent. I hope you enjoyed the show today. I really enjoyed bringing it to you. Next week, we'll be talking to someone who eats low carb, who has type 1 diabetes. We'll be talking to Elizabeth, the founder of Touch by Type 1, and much more. If you're listening in a podcast app, please press subscribe. If you're loving the show, please share it with someone else. And if you're listening online, that's not how the kids do it anymore. You can if you want. I'm not going to hassle you. But your apps on the phone, way better ways to listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. I appreciate it when you share the show with others and review it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I really enjoyed bringing it to you. I'll be back soon with much more.